Well, good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Mitchell Park uh, Community Center. Um, I'm, my name is Ruth Ann. I'm the manager of the library right next door. Um, I want to welcome you all to tonight's event, When Home Won't Let You Stay, Stories of Escape and Refuge. This is our, I believe, our fourth event with the Media Center. Elliot and I met a few years ago at the library and really became quick, good friends, I think, <laughs> good partners, good community partners and friends. And it seemed to make perfect sense that both of our organizations collaborate on storytelling programs such as this, um, because, especially because everyone is welcome at the library. Um, I, think, I think we all know that not all libraries look the same and are funded the same way and have the same amount of hours and wonderful collections and services and programs. But we all have the same fundamental belief that our libraries are for everybody and everyone's welcome in them. And libraries all over the country work really hard to create programs for new Americans and newcomers, ESL programs, those kinds of things so that people feel um, that they are welcome in our, in our spaces. Um, I think, let me see. And then of course we rely on our partners such as the Media Center to help make these uh, experiences come true for, for people who visit and use the library. I think the last time we had our Dreamers event, which is about two years ago now, I said something to the effect that, you know, if more people use their libraries and read and were informed, we'd have a much better world. And I think you can all agree with that. Um, tonight, I'd also just like to remind folks, you know, if, if we read stories and listen to stories and talk about stories, such as we'll hear tonight, that also helps us to become more empathetic, and I think that's really important um, in our world. So we need everyone using their library so that they're informed, but also so that they're a lot more empathetic. Um, I, know you, I know you know where the restrooms are. I do want to make a big plug for the friends of the library who, who helped tonight's program. They funded all the food and refreshments you have tonight. Um, Elliot's staff did a wonderful job coordinating nearly all of the events, so thank you to them too. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> all right, well, thanks again. I hope you're all inspired by tonight's stories. Thank you. I'm Elliot Margulies from the Media Center, and welcome. We're so glad you came to witness uh, When Home Won't Let You Stay, Stories of Escape and Refuge. Why didn't we just call it Refugee Stories, you might wonder. Well, the term refugees, it's become a hot potato for the last couple of years, and it drives a wedge between us and them. So some say refugees, they, they use up so many resources, keep them out. Or some say groups of refugees include terrorists, keep them all away. But tonight, we want to go behind headlines. We want to go to the human experiences. So refugees, they don't choose to leave their homelands. As you're going to hear, many of them never imagined leaving the home they loved until violence and repression upended their lives. And oftentimes, in just a few really scary, unexpected, crazy months. And then they had to leave, and, or they were stuck here, and they couldn't get back. So tonight, you're going to hear about starting over as well, letting go of everything you knew and building a new life brick by brick. Tonight, you're going to hear five inspiring American stories. And you're going you're gonna to realize that them is us. Think of your own families. Are, is there anybody in this room who traces their own lineage back to a country that was suffering from violence or repression or natural disaster and that led to your family coming here. Raise your hand. So it's really, look around, there, there's really at least a third to a half of this audience. Um, when I was in high school, I went to uh, a religious boarding school in Chicago and about every month or month and a half, I'd go visit my grandparents' apartment. Now, they mostly spoke Yiddish to each other, which I didn't understand, and mostly they were quiet people. 
but I just ate. I ate and I ate because my Bobby, she made food that was a million times better than the dormitory stuff. Her kishka, her chopped liver, her potato kugel, her tegrach, it was incredible. But I never asked them any questions. I didn't ask any questions until decades after they'd both died. And I found out that my grandmother, she comes from Lithuania with a new baby to show her immigrant parents in Chicago, America. It's summer, 1939. Well, a few weeks later, Hitler's armies invaded Lithuania. She could not get back to her son or her husband. And it was eight long years before she found out what happened to them. They'd been shot along with many of the Jewish men in their town. Well, meanwhile, my grandmother had learned enough English. She got a job in a bakery. She became a kindergarten teacher. And then when she found out she was a widow, she met my grandfather and married him. Whoops, turn off your cell phones. <laughs> um, sorry. We Americans, we Americans mostly have family histories that started somewhere else, somewhere with a different language, different customs. And let's face it, we're a nation of risk takers. A lot of people are refugees, and a lot of people carry some pain and some loss, and yet amazingly focus laser energies on their future, on the future of our, our whole country. So tonight, we're going to listen to the stories and we'll feel connected. We'll think of our own ancestors. And we can be proud that a lot of people can come to this country and start over in peace and freedom. It's an American value, even though it's one that we have to keep picking up and dusting off again and again. One would hope that over time there'd be fewer wars, there'd be fewer governments that suddenly discriminate against people from their religion or race, but unfortunately that's not the case. There's more displaced people in the world now than when the UN, since the UN has started keeping track. At the end of 2016, there were 65 and a half million people displaced from their homes. Now that is slightly, slightly more than the population of France. So take all of France and consider everybody looking for somewhere else to live. And then you have the picture of what it is today and that doesn't even include the Rohingya or people since 2016. So I want to acknowledge all of you that came here tonight to open your hearts to not an easy subject and to, to really listen to some stories you, you haven't heard before. I want to thank, we have two of the Media Center board members here tonight. One's in the uh, back, Azib, uh, and one is sitting, just wave your hand, Sue. I saw you before, Sue Purdy Pelosi. Thank you for coming and supporting this. I want to thank uh, the library, and you saw Ruth Ann. She's an incredibly wonderful partner. And uh, I want to thank Danya Khan. I don't know if she's there. She was at the reception table. She organized all the food and the art that we saw. Uh, and thanks to Acton Family Giving for making it all possible. Now last, but most importantly, thank you in advance to our five storytellers. Now, not one of them is a performer. In fact, you can imagine how nervous they are about to get up on this stage in front of 100 people. So add to that the fact that English is not any of their first language. And you kind of start to get a picture that your job tonight is to embrace them with your warmth and support. Mm -hmm. It's my pleasure to introduce Rona Papal. And Rona was born in Kabul, Afghanistan to a well-off family who owned a textile factory. 
everything was full of hope and excitement for Afghanistan and for Rona and her new husband when they came to America in, uh, so he could work at the United Nations. It was 1977. But within two years, war was, had changed everything in Afghanistan and it continues that way today. They kept thinking, oh, it'll all be okay in a couple of months and we'll return. But instead, they had to recreate their lives here in the States, and she'll tell you. Rona worked for 15 years at Alameda County Social Services in the Refugee Department. She then became Executive Director of the Afghan Coalition in Fremont, which is where we would do our meetings. And for the past 20 years, I guess it's a blessing and it's also not, it's also sad that her focus is on successive waves of refugees from, from Afghanistan. She and her husband have raised two daughters and a son. One daughter is a partner at Price Waterhouse, another daughter is a scientist, and their son is attending college at Cal Poly. So Rona, come on up, give her a hand. And Thank you, Ms. Arelia, the Media Center, and the library to give us a time so I can talk to you about who I am and why we are here. On April 1978, I was in my uh, um, New York apartment. And when I turned the TV on and suddenly I heard the news, there's a coup happened in Afghanistan and it was the Soviet, um, milit uh, Afghan military pro-Soviet, and they are um, violently killed the president and his family, even their little children. So we were very panicked. Uh, we don't know what to do. We are desperately, we wanted to call and see how is our family doing. And for two weeks, we couldn't get to call Afghanistan, all the lines was didn't work. So after when we heard from them, and they said, we wanna come back, we wanna help, or we really, we didn't came here to stay. They said, no, we wanna go back. And they said, nope, you can't go back. Your life is in danger, or you're gonna be in prison if you go back. And also, we little we did know about that we are the first wave of Afghan refugees in the United States. So in thousands of years, we n never dreamed something like this happened to Afghanistan. Afghanistan was poor, but very peaceful country. People took care of each other. We had poor, but not very uh, desperate. We had uh, rich people, some and the capital, which is my father, one of them had textile company, and my mom was working in a volunteer with a group of uh, King's family. So when I was 18, my mom and my family arranged my marriage with my husband. And uh, that time, my husband um, was working in foreign affair, and he, um, took a test, a national test, and he got second. And, uh, and he got, suddenly got opportunity to, so he can go to work at UN representative of Afghanistan. So we suddenly got married and uh, moved to New York City. So the night that we came to the airport, and we didn't know anything about, we never came here, and uh, uh, for me, language was a problem, but my husband knew uh, English very well. So we didn't know what to do because nobody was there to greet us. So we were looking what we should do, where to go. And finally, we found an Afghan taxi driver. <laughs> I said, hey, <laughs> and said, you know, we are here and we don't know where to go. So he took us to his apartment for one night and then the next day we took care of it. 
So Afghan government at that time was disorganized and poor, and because we just end the monarchy in 1973. So in 1978, when the Russian um, completely took over Afghanistan, it was that time that my husband made a big decision in his life and said, I'm not a communist and it's against my principle, I'm not gonna work anymore, and he resigned. And we left with a very unknown future, didn't know what to do. So, but in order to, we have to live, uh, my husband was doing a odds job, like truck driving, delivery, and working in a convenient store. And I have to also, selling my jewelry I had, selling one of the very expensive rag that I brought in order to so we can live. So New York was very expensive. We couldn't live there and we have to move to California. <laughs> <laughs> it was 1980. <laughs> so meanwhile, my mom and my family was in Afghanistan and their life was in danger. My father died very heartbroken because one day he was in his factory and suddenly one of those factory workers came and, and called him very bad names. And, and for him it was very hard and it's still for as hard to see my father work so hard. Thousands of people were working there. As suddenly everything is nothing. And that night when he came home and he told my mom that I lost hope. And on that night he had a heart attack. And it was a curfew time and my mom couldn't call a doctor or couldn't take him to a hospital. So in a Muslim culture, usually on the 40th day, everybody get together to pray for the dead person. And everybody was in our house and suddenly there was a, um, they called and they said, everybody have to go home because the soldier looking for you guys. So my uncles and my cousins, everybody ran home so on that night, they round them up and put them in prison for one or two years. So the factory took over by the communist government. So it's that time my mom was, my father died and my mom had no income. And finally, one of the president of that factory from the communists, which is uh, hired, he knew my family. So what he did, he was, giving my mom some of the small pieces of this uh, material that they were making so she can sell and um, you know, live her life. So working with Afghan refugees over the past decades, I realized we are so lucky that my family is still intact. I never was at the war on those uh, destruction, bombs, I never see that, or tortured, or raped. But eventually, I saw another group of Afghans, which is now they are arriving, De these are the translators. We call them the children of wars. So these are the children who born and raised during bar war. They don't know nothing but the war. And for them it's very hard, their family lives or marriage life, because they never been at home. They always were outside and working with the US Army. So they are the one, the unlucky one. Even though I have lived all of my life in the US, not all, majority of my life in the US, but I still appreciate 
because they gave me this opportunity for me and my children have a future to live. But it's still, and deep down in my heart, I still always feel like to be Afghan. Almost four decades after we left, I still feel responsible to go back and fix it. My three kids, even they born here, they never went to Afghanistan, but they call themselves Afghan American. There's so much to rebuild, from a building on the outside to broken human spirit in the inside. In some way, I had no choice to be the Afghan fixer in my work here. It is an identity that I will never outgrow. Let me tell you a story. When I left Afghanistan, I always dreaming my house in Afghanistan. And after 9-11, I had the opportunity to go back and see what's going on. And when I went to inside the Kabul capital, I couldn't realize that is the city that I left before. Everything was destroyed. There was no trees, no buildings. So I went to look to see where is my house. First I went and I saw my husband's house is completely destroyed. And then I came to see our house, what happened. And I saw half of our house was bombed. I think the rocket hit. And all these gla glasses shattered all over. And there was five, six families living inside. And after that, my, I never dream my house again because my dream completely shattered. Thank you. So our next uh, storyteller is Tuhig Arabian. And Tuhig was born and raised in Aleppo, Syria. It's a place probably everybody in this room has heard of, but not for that long. She received a BA in English Literature in Aleppo and taught ESL to adults. But the, when the city became a war-torn nightmare, almost overnight, she escaped with her two daughters. And her husband is with us tonight. Where are you? Wave your hand. There he is. He joined her 18 months later. And they live in an apartment in Milbrae. And Tuchig is a salesperson for a jewelry store in San Francisco. Now, she might be upset with what I'm going to say now, but she wrote me an email a couple of days ago that I just treasure, and I'm going to share some of what she said. Okay. Um, she said, thank you for checking in. In fact, I've been so nervous that I've been postponing everything I need to do. I'm even waking up early. It's already been a very busy and hectic few weeks, and I haven't been having enough time to sleep. I can't believe I finally memorized everything. That is, if I don't forget everything. This is something completely out of my comfort zone, but I do believe that telling your story helps you heal and recover from it, and at the same time, it educates our listeners. When you go through an experience and then all of a sudden you find yourself in a fast-paced life, you usually try to keep up, forgetting that you needed a moment to digest what happened and contemplate a little bit about what took place. People usually don't ask you any questions, and they're probably not even interested to know about the details. All they know is you're alive. Initially, you do want to tell people about your stories, but then you get caught up in the hectic lifestyle and forget you even had a story. I'm happy that I stepped out of my comfort zone and took this time. Stories are, in fact, powerful. So, Tuchig, come join us. Uh, 
Have you ever wondered why you're still alive? While someone else you knew, you knew isn't? Or have you ever wondered why you still have arms, and legs, and eyes, while um, someone else you know doesn't? These were everyday thoughts that passed through my mind when I first escaped the Syrian civil war. My name is Tuhig, and I'm a Syrian Armenian. I was born and raised in Aleppo, Syria. And just like all the other Armenians in Aleppo, my grandparents survived the Armenian genocide in 1915, when one and a half million Armenians were killed and massacred in the hands of the Ottoman Turks. My father, a self-made man, um, lost his ancestral house in Antab, and then his parents' house in uh, Rırıkhan, both in modern-day Turkey. Therefore, if there was a lesson that he had never forgotten from his childhood, it was that we should never feel too grounded or attached to this new country who so lovingly accepted us because any moment we could be subject to what happened to him, leaving everything behind and having to start all over again. After all, this has been the destiny of Armenians for centuries. How ironical that nearly a century later, it was me who was going to flee, leaving the city that offered my father a safe harbor. Despite my father's and a lot of older generations' perspective, if you would tell anyone from my generation or younger that Aleppo would become a place with bombs falling on our houses, helicopters hovering over our neighborhoods, car bombs exploding, and um, snipers shooting from the rooftops, who would have told you there's no way. Aleppo was the safest place on earth. Aleppo was a place where I, where we spent our summer days in the swimming clubs, where I sang in three different choirs, where I attended um, scouting church youth group activities, art, and piano classes. It's where I went to university and got a degree in English literature. Armenians were a small Christian minority. After settling in Aleppo, within a course of a generation, Armenian survivors went from being refugees to middle class citizens bringing their contribution in every aspect of arts and all kinds of industries. We had our own hospitals, libraries, theaters, sports clubs, uh, cultural centers, more than 10 churches, and more than 15 schools. My two older sisters got married in the US, so after about 15 years of uh, being away from them, my uh, family and I moved to the US uh, to reunite with them. Uh, a year later, I went back to Aleppo, got married, stayed there for seven more years. Life in Aleppo wasn't stressful or complicated. It was relaxing, fun, and full of social life. Muslim Arabs, who were the majority, were living peacefully with all kinds of minorities, like Christian Arabs, Assyrians, Kurds, and Armenians. No one talked about religion or politics, but we all kept our distinct identity. My husband's family was quite rooted in Aleppo. 
They had, burn, they had built their own uh, um, uh, successful manufacturing plant, and they were selling their own brand of uh, oil and air filters uh, locally as well as exporting them. My husband was uh, managing the factory, and their business was prospering so much that he had no intention to come to the U.S. During those years, we began our family with two daughters. It was a period of unprecedented progress in Aleppo. New malls, fast internet, restaurants, hotels, supermarkets, water parks. It all started about um, mid-2011, when we first heard about tensions in a city called Dara. We heard about demonstrations here and there. We heard about the emergence of the Free Syrian Army. We didn't know if this was good or bad, but we didn't imagine that the tensions would come to Aleppo. Um, then we heard about the forces entering another city called Hams. There was a civil war with bombings and shootings that lasted for months, but it all seemed remote to us. We assumed our government would reinstate stability. Then towards the end of 2011, Al-Qaeda forces started approaching Aleppo borders. There were kidnappings and booby-trapped cars, and people became, started becoming afraid of leaving their houses. By mid-2012, we heard of properties being confiscated and more violence. We heard that jihad was being preached in some mosques outside Aleppo. Radical Muslims against Christians and even against non-radical or moderate Muslims. A lot of people couldn't believe that Aleppo could become such a dangerous place where Diversity could turn into mistrust and fear. I remember being in a restaurant with my husband and his family. And we were counting the sounds of the bombs exploding in another neighborhood, maybe half an hour away. 40, 41, 42. We were relaxed, <laughs> thinking, they're not here. Imagine, during that period, we even bought new furniture for the kids' room, since our baby was going to share her uh, sister's room. Uh, I remember vividly uh, the day in July when we got the phone call from the Bible camp my daughter attended. They were sending the kids home because the troops were advancing. They were now in Aleppo. We stayed in our house for a week. Um, there was a meeting of neighbors one night, and they were talking about kidnappings. We heard that Armenians were targeted because they were perceived as government supporters. I was so frightened. My in-laws were still in denial, but I told my husband, I have to get out without the others. Soon, the snipers and helicopters became common sounds. We stayed in our homes, only um, working a few hours a day. We could hear the guns shooting. Every day, my husband uh, went out looking for plane tickets to anywhere. We heard terrible stories about people who tried to escape Aleppo by car. My husband had a close friend who had uh, a friend who worked at the Armenian Airlines, uh, and she could, fi she could find some tickets for us. It was in the middle of the pitch 
darkness. My husband walked all the way to a hotel that had electricity in order to print uh, the plane tickets. It was 110 degrees, um, scorching hot August nights. My friends were over to help me pack under candlelights and help with the kids. I barely slept for an hour and then woke up to see my seven-month-old baby sleeping with only diapers on in the middle of the do uh, um, balcony doorway. She had cried so much that my friends had to cool her off on the floor. We began our dangerous journey um, to the airport. There were a lot of checkpoints meant by different armies. Um, we didn't know who controlled the airport. I covered my hair in case we were stopped by uh, an, Al an Al Qaeda checkpoint. We paid for a taxi that was nearly as expensive as the <laughs> airplane tickets. Um, we were stopped uh, by a checkpoint by the Free Syrian Army. They looked at our IDs and let us pass. At the airport, everyone was exchanging stories of uh, how they escaped and got there. We flew to uh, Armenia and then to San Francisco. My husband stayed uh, another week or so, then uh, made it by car to Lebanon. I was so relieved. Living in such an expensive place wasn't easy for me. I looked for jobs day in and day out. Um, my little one was just a baby, but it was more difficult for my five-year-old then to leave her home and her father. Even though I was so lucky to have the support of my family, my Armenian community, and the church. It was still hard to leave everything behind and live with my family without my husband. At night, I would sing to them the same lullaby. And my daughter would stop me. Mom, don't sing this lullaby again. This reminds me of my happy days with my dad. And then she would share some happy me memories. She had so many questions in her mind, trying to make sense of things. Mom, did God create those bad people who destroyed our city? If they knew that God loves them, would they change their mind? My husband joined me 18 months later. God graciously provided our needs in such unexpected ways every step of the way. Our university degrees from, from Syria don't count for much. <clears throat> but we're thankful that we now have jobs and can afford an apartment in Milbury. Having and then losing material possessions teaches me that I can't always plan my future and I'm not in control of my life, but he is. It teaches me that I shouldn't put my trust in what is changeable, but in him alone. It teaches me that God is able to give me the strength to start all over again, just like he strengthened my father and my grandparents after the genocide. We're thankful that we're safe and healthy. We are thankful that our small family is together again. And I still wonder why I'm still alive 
while someone else isn't. And I still have some survivor's guilt. But I know, however, for sure, that God has a different plan for everyone. And this was his plan for us. Thank you. Uh, our next storyteller, Kui Li, he lives in Seattle, Washington. So how did this happen? Well, uh, a couple of years ago, I worked with his daughter, Emily, who's, who was a teacher at that point in Redwood City. And when I was looking for people to become storytellers, I called her and said, do you know anybody who has a story, anything like your dad's? And she says, use my dad, he would be great. Um, and he'll come down and, and be part of it. And so Kui and I have gotten to know each other through Skype meetings mostly. Um, you're gonna be pretty amazed. Um, talk about going out of your comfort zone. He's, he's gone to another planet here. He's an engineer. Uh, and, but when he tells you the story of his escape from Vietnam, uh, I want you to bear in mind, not only is it like a movie, but he was a teenager when he was leading this and, and developing the plan. Uh, before the escape, Kui was repairing motorcycles in Saigon and selling things on the black market to get by. And he's used the same perseverance throughout his years in the United States. And his three kids are now all professionals. There's a doctor, there's an engineer who's here tonight. We're, wave your hand, yeah, Alex. And then there's our teacher, Emily. And um, can we come on up and share your story? Alice, you uh, remind me to use my car. But, you know, after the story, you guys know how am I. So that's why I still need my note instead of my car. <laughs> And uh, also, I am like Apple II, just less than one, one megabyte memory. <laughs> uh, so I need this flash car here, okay? So go back to the old years. Okay. For the Vietnam history, let's go back to 1975, because that's the, uh, the year that the war was over for many, many decades. It was in 1975 in Vietnam. I was living in Saigon, the, south, the capital of the South Vietnam. The North had won the war. The Northwest communists won the war. Everything was different under the communist control. Even though my family had been in Vietnam for more than four generations, we were discriminated by the communists because we'd come from China. They call us the Hua and label it us as the capitalists because many Hua had operated businesses and there was political conflict between Vietnam and China. And the Hua people were caught in the middle. After the war, most businesses were declared illegal. Families who'd been in business sometimes were taken by force and dropped off at the new economy zone in the remote area where there were no food and no resources and where it was hard to restart a new life. Sometimes they searched our homes and business and confiscated goods. One time at midnight, 12 policemen arrived at our house and searched for money and goods. Luckily, you know, my dad and my mom, they are good. They hid some, a lot of valuable belongings to a place that the police cannot find them. Right after their victory, 
the radio stopped playing all music that we, we grew up with in the South and replaced it by aggressive revolutionary music from the North. It's hard for me. Everything was slogans and propaganda. Everywhere were red flags and communist police. Many people, getting, many people were getting arrested and sent to re-education camps. Sai Ruang had become red. We had to attend weekly meetings about politics. I felt like I couldn't brief. I couldn't live at all. I feel like I'm very disappointed. One day, I questioned a policeman about the policy toward the Hua people. An hour later, I was brought to the police station for questioning. They accused me of working for the CIA. I was the oldest of 12 children, just graduated from high school. I started to work two businesses. One, motorcycle, repairing motorcycles, and the other in the black market. I began planning how my family could escape from Vietnam. At first, I considered escape by foot to the jungles of Laos to reach Thailand, where we could find a refugee camp. I spent a lot of time planning out how to do this. I went to Ho Chi Minh Trail three times to figure it out in detail. I even bought a used bloody camouflage uniform in case it would come in handy to plan in as a communist soldier. We would need to survive the jungle where there were malaria carrying mosquitoes and poisonous snakes. We would need hammocks to, to sleep for sleeping, map, compass, food, water. We need to hide from the Vietnamese Liberation Army stationed in Laos. The journey would take a month. Finally, I came to realize that it would be impossible because my young siblings would not have to make this difficult journey. We needed a different plan. In 1976, relatives suggested that I partner up with three of them to buy a boat. We decided to take an opportunity to purchase a boat for 50 ounces of gold. Just so you understand how much money it is. Our whole house was worth only 10 ounces of gold. In the next 10 months, we poured energy into remodeling the boat to get it ready for the journey to Malaysia, where we would be able to find a refugee camp. Meanwhile, I taught myself how to navigate to the ocean. We listened to the BBC news on the radios every night. Even it was illegal to know which parts of the ocean to avoid because of pirate activity. I bought a compass in the black market and almost got caught and put in jail. Finally, in October of 1978, we pay for counterfeit travel permits that would get us through police checkpoints 
on our way to the southernmost city of Vietnam called Ca Mau. That's where our boat was waiting. I was 20 years old at this point. So you know how old am I now. <laughs> the day of the escape, everyone loaded onto the boat. An officer took a final head count to make sure we'd pay for everyone. There were 265 passengers, 265 boat people. That's how many we, we needed for the amount of prime money we had to pay. But was it too many for our 55 foot boat only six hours into the ocean on South China Sea, South China Sea? A big wave hit and cracked the tip of our boat. My dad and uncle fixed it using a handsaw and extra wood that they had bought. Not long after, we were stopped by the Venice Navy. When we told them the password that the government officials sold to us, they allow us to proceed. The journey took three days. Most everyone vomited. The crowded bottom compartment of the boat was smelly and humid. Everyone was miserable. Finally, I spotted the lighthouse that we were looking for. We make it Government officers would not let us land it in our boat. They forced us to Singapore. It was dark and very hot. Our steering wheel, our steering wheel cable was broken. The boat was unstable in the stormy weather. My dad quickly fixed the cable. We turned back and landed where we were there the day before. This time, once we landed, my cousin cut a hole to the bottom of our boat. As we were sinking, and the Malaysians were forced to take us. We make it. <laughs> At the Pulau refugee camp, my family quickly claimed a place to build a shelter. We also dug a well and a deep hole for a toilet. For nearly a year, we survived on rations of rice and sardines from the United Nations. Eventually, in 1979, my family was sponsored to enter America. I went to Houston. I have ten dollars when I arrived. I lived with my sponsor and looked for work, but nobody wanted to hire me because my English was poor. 
I heard about an oil rubber fittings factory where the work was dangerous and the temperature was extremely hot. I walked four hours to get there and told the supervisor if he saw me what to do, I would work a day for free. And he, and he could decide whether to hire me. He gave me a job. Yes. <laughs> he bought me a Coke and Big Mac for lunch. Yes. <laughs> he even drove me home on his motorcycle. 60, hour per, 60 miles per hour on highway, no helmet. <laughs> We're cool, but you guys don't do it, okay? <laughs> I worked 60 hours a week for two months, then moved to Seattle. I found a part-time job as a diesel washer. Later, I attended community college to learn English. I got accepted to the University of Washington, where I studied electrical engineering. Then I got a job with IBM. There were a few things that I brought here from Vietnam. One was a beautiful leaf from a tree that grew all around my hometown. I put it between the pages of a book and have it still because I have to remember that's where I was from. The other was my high school education. I always stress to my children that education is something and nobody can take away from you. We are proud to be American citizen and know that this is our home. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our next storyteller is Margaret Petros, and she was born and raised in a suburb of Baghdad, Iraq. She arrived in the U.S. in 1980, just as she entered high school. No calculations. <laughs> That's what, um, after Saddam Hussein came to power, life changed dramatically. Saddam thrived on creating divisions and also getting people to inform on each other. I remember Margaret saying, we all knew the barber was an informant. Margaret worked for 20 years for the Santa Clara County's Victims Assistance Program, mostly as a supervisor. In 2009, she became executive director of Mothers Against Murder that provides similar support to families of murder victims. She was a Santa Clara County Commissioner for 20 years. Her husband, Hazim, works for Seagate. Their three kids are all poised to do great things, too, with their college degrees. So come on up. Oh, and I want to say thanks, Margaret. Also, uh, she made the hummus that you might have tasted before dinner. So she was memorizing a story and cooking at the same time. On Sunday, September 30th, 1979, I remember standing outside the home that I was born in, talking to my childhood sweetheart, who's telling me, uh, why are you leaving? I will never leave my country, and for what? To end up working at a restaurant in America? This is the same man I end up marrying 13 years later, <laughs> and together for 27 years now. I also remember the whole um, block of neighbors in tears as my father, my sister, and I said our goodbyes to them. Um, as we knocked on the doors um, telling them we're leaving the next morning. Every household is coming outside watching us knock on another door, and we're all crying. 
not everyone left the way we did. Um, they left in secret in the middle of the night because of the fear of the government, uh, including my best friend. Um, I woke up one morning and I was told, they're gone. It's like, how? No way. It's not possible. I walked to her house, and sure enough, they were gone, leaving everything behind. It was difficult for my mother to actually leave. Um, she was connected uh, to a large family, 13 siblings. But uh, we did leave, and as um, we went uh, to Jordan, we end up in Jordan. I'm, we, we're um, Assyrian Christians, and it's just very difficult um, to accept that. I remember my father being nervous and scared when we got to Jordan. He opened his dictionary and wrote to my uncle, uh, sharing his fears. I remember him crying when he was writing the letter. Uh, we were a big family. What will we do in America? How will we survive? My uncle, as he read the letter, jumped on a plane and came to Jordan to visit us, assuring my father that it's okay. He can sponsor us. He can support us. Not to fear that. Um, soon after, my mother sold our home in Dora uh, under the table and joined us in Jordan for the um, big travel. Um, my father um, was happy. We were all happy in Iraq before Saddam Hussein came to power. He was a television repairman, worked full time, as well as um, had a small shop next to our um, house. There were only two channels in Iraq at that time. So th that was the only form of entertainment. So my father's job was important. I remember people knocking on our door at midnight asking him to fix their TV. So his job was really indispensable. And um, also, uh, two years before we left, uh, my parents had sent my oldest sister to study in Illinois at a college, and that's when my father visited her. He took a trip from Illinois to California. And imagine not one checkpoint stop <laughs> all the way. He was really amazed and sold on this country. So when he came back, he was like, oh, we're going. I'm not leaving my children here. And then the last straw that really um, broke the camel's back was the school year started, and we were handed the Quran to study it. And that's when my father immediately removed us from school, and we left. Um, I'm, we, we're um, Assyrian Christians, and it's just very difficult um, to accept that. In Chicago, when we got to Chicago, was my older brother and sister started working minimum wage jobs, as well as we survived on the uh, funds that we brought from us from the sale of the house for two years. And then we moved to California because of the weather, of course. Uh, in 1983, I graduated from Malpedas High School with $500 scholarship to Mission College, got my AA degree in social sciences, and transferred to San Jose State University uh, to get my bachelor's in political science. Uh, all throughout this while in the state, I connected to my friends and my childhood sweetheart in Iraq. So when I graduated in 1987 and became a United American citizen, I really wanted to go back, and I did. But uh, what I saw in Iraq was devastating. It was during the Iraq-Iran war. Every house I visited, there were women wearing black. There were black flyers in the streets, banners outside doors saying the fifth child and the last child died in the war, the sixth and the last child. It was miserable. I was supposed to stay there for 
four weeks, I cut my vacation short, and I told myself, I'm never coming back again. Um, and then as the war ended, um, Hazem called me, and every day started writing romantic letters to me. Uh, it wasn't like that when I visited Iraq, so I asked him what happened, and he was like, I was in the military. I could have ended up dead. There was no hope there, so why? Now that the war is over, uh, what are we going to do? I was not going back to Iraq, and he couldn't come back to the United States. So we were talking about meeting in another country where he could get a visa, and probably Greece. And then Saddam Hussein invades Kuwait. That's like, men that have been in wars, not seen their families, children born without fathers, the war ended. What business do you have starting another one? So travel was banned, no phone calls. Thankfully, the coalition forces liberated Kuwait. Uh, it wasn't too long. And a few days after that, I got a phone call from my now husband saying, I'm in Jordan. Are you coming to figure out where our relationship is going? <laughs> I was like, yes. Stay there, I'm coming. <laughs> I took a three weeks vacation, went to Jordan. Within three days, I accepted the marriage proposal. Uh, we got married in 91, and then he joined me nine months later in the States. Uh, fortunate, he was able to work in the field that um, he studied uh, for uh, the past 26 years as a senior engineer at a Silicon Valley company. We have three children. Um, the youngest one is now in college at New York University, and I'm proud to say he served and was elected as president of his high school at Los Altos four years. But he would not go into politics, <laughs> no way. He's studying filming and productions. So, um, as for me, uh, again, I, you know, I, I, I love working uh, and um, in the field of uh, finding justice for people. Still help um, anyone who asks that's related to victimization and, the, uh, you know, bringing justice. Um, now, these years, I find it very difficult to read the news from Iraq. I feel heart sick about the people who are left there. Even under Saddam Hussein, there were no children begging in the streets. There were no children homeless. Now we see it on TV all the times. It's just unbelievable. All and worse happened after 2003 and the fall of Saddam. I am thankful we were able to leave a very dangerous and tragic country in the world. To start a new life and not being afraid that anyone would come knocking on our door. Thanks um, to my father as well as um, Uncle William. I really, I. I Every time I, you know, read the news or uh, hear of uh, families in such a horrific situation in Iraq, I just say thanks to what my dad um, did. And it was not easy for him. It was not easy for any one of us. So thank you for allowing me to tell my story. So we're to our last storyteller who's... Gaze Kadania, and Gaze grew up in the new sovereign nation of Eritrea after its long war for independence from Ethiopia. But things have not worked out so well in terms of democracy or the high hopes for freedom that 
uh, and prosperity that many Eritreans had. Many of us know about refugees from Sudan and from Somalia, but there's also a massive exodus, particularly among young people, from Eritrea. Gaze came here in 2008 with a master's degree in marine biology, I'll tell you more about, but had to develop new skills to make a living here. So over the years, he began at De Anza College and then Texas Tech after work and ended up with a degree in clinical lab science. And now he works for Sutter Health and for Kaiser, analyzing lab specimens and doing microbiology. And I don't know if Hannah, Hannah's way in the back. That's his wife, and you'll hear about her in the story. Uh, she works at a dry cleaners, and the two of them are raising, I don't know if he wants to wave, but Emmanuel, two years old, and nine-month-old Ariam in Dublin. Uh, so you may want to call me a draft dodger. However, when you hear my story, I think you will agree that I had a good reason to escape. I am from Eritrea, and I left my country in 2006 to attend a graduate program in Belgium. So uh, we Eritreans are uh, leaving the country in a very, very significant number, and uh, we, we are actually running away from the very oppressive national service. The national service is obligatory, so there is no way that you can avoid it. So, uh, and as a result of that, you will find many Eritrean refugees around the world. And uh, to give you a bit of history, Eritrea is the second newest country in Africa. It just got its independence in 1991. And this happened after a 30 year war for independence with Ethiopia. So we were under the Italians, then the Ethio uh, British, and then finally under Ethiopia. So Eritreans fought for their independence from 1961 to 1991. In this perspective, you will imagine that a country as new as that should learn a lot from the history of all African na nations and be the best that it could be in Africa. However, things didn't go that way. Instead, well, we were very happy. Uh, we were very happy. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> we, 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 Eritreans, were very happy. And uh, we were uh, excited with the. Uh, Sorry. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, uh, we were very happy uh, and we are very excited even with the declaration of the obligatory or mandatory national service and it was part of the constitution. However, the current president who decided to be a president for life has put the constitution on shelf as well as all the trappings or checks and balances that are needed for establishing a democratic nation. There is no room for democracy, there is no room for election, there is no room for any sort of uh, uh, human right or individual rights. So once you are into the national service, you cannot be outside of that. And the national service is very arbitrary. It can go up to 10 years. Imagine, I graduated high school in 1998, so people who went into the national service since there are still there. And they cannot pay anything. There is no way that you can pay. So serving your nation is a good thing. However, serving a nation where the leadership is dictatorship is a kind of a curse. So luckily, I was accepted into the only university in the country. So which means my national service has to start after my graduation. And I graduated from the University of Asmara in marine biology and fisheries in 2002. Then I was assigned to the Minister of Tourism to do my national service. However, even though this was meant for one year, uh, it went up to the third year. And by the end of the third year, there was no end on side. So, and as I say, the country starts to go from bad to worse. The, the leader was a very popular guy. He was a well-known, he was very liked. 
But as of now, he is one of the well-known dictators in Africa, even in the world. And our country, which was gained after the, la the losting of many lives, is now being tamed as the North Korea of Africa, which is really very sad because part of my family, which is my dad, including <laughs> yeah, four of his siblings has to, to participate in the war, and four of my uncles has passed away. It's only my dad who made it alive. But anyway, <coughs> sorry. <coughs> so it, it was really uh, very difficult for me to, uh, to serve the nation at the same time serve a dictatorial regime. And I am relatively educated to, to the ordinary citizens of the country. So I decided to I mean, get a very close friend of mine, discuss about what is going on in our country, and we always have to say, we are wasting our lives. There is no way that we can, we can you know, uh, 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 build or kind of plan our future, earn a, re a real salary for that matter. So I started to develop a plan. I said I should leave the country, either to Sudan or Ethiopia, and both countries has a, a, a refugee centers just for Eritreans. So it was not also acceptable for me to leave the country for without any plan at hand. So I decided maybe if I make it luckily, if I become very successful, I should try applying for a scholarship first and see if I can get one. So I applied to uh, a full scholarship from Belgium. It's called uh, the uh, Vler Scholarship. It is given for international students from all over the, 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 the world, from the developing countries. So I was lucky that I was awarded a full scholarship. I have not to pay anything. Until I came to the United States, I never paid a penny to study. <laughs> so it was, it was, it was very <laughs> a very different thing for me to go to school and pay for that. So uh, uh, to make a, a long story short, I decided to leave. And at that time, my wife now was my girlfriend. She also uh, became Omber, and she is willing that she doesn't want to be part of the national service. She said there is no future for her. And then, and then we decided uh, to leave. Uh, so for some technical matters, I have to stay a little bit uh, behind. So my, my wife left uh, uh, 10 days ahead of me. So uh, she went to Sudan. And then uh, the same with me, I have to travel from the capital to a, a border town near Sudan. It took me about eight hours by bus, and it's very tough at this time. Uh, you have many checkpoints at every direction, and if you are suspected of escaping, you could be, you know, you could be taken into, uh, into prison and be in the national service for unlimited period of time. I went to the uh, border town, and then uh, the plan was, to, to wait for a trafficker because I knew a friend in the town who knows a trafficker. And uh, with the trafficker, that should be when? April 6, 2006. I have to wake up uh, early in the morning, sit on a bench at 8 p.m., uh, uh, sorry, 8 a.m., start uh, uh, drinking a cup of tea, have a newspaper, and wait for my uh, trafficker. So time goes by, and it was very difficult as <laughs> As I start to, uh, to wait for a long period, I start to panic. All the negative scenarios start to come into mind. What if someone not that I'm new to this area and I have been here for a long time, if they reported me to the authorities, what would happen? What if, if my trafficker didn't show up? And so, <laughs> however, luckily, the trafficker was watching me from afar to make sure that it is really me. So I have to wait when uh, the sign was, I have to wear my necklace with a cross and then I was always, you know, handy, uh, holding that one so that he can, he can have a sense that it is me. Then he made sure, he gave me a sign, uh, and then he motioned me. I followed him. We went into his car, and then 90 minutes later, we are in Sudan. So I was in Sudan, in the refugee camp for Eritrea. It's very close to the border. So being outside of Eritrea is one thing, but being a refugee is also another thing. Because as a refugee, actually, you lose almost everything. You, you, you feel like you are nobody. You feel like you have no future at all. So I really start to panic, OK. And the other reason is the refugee camp is very close to the border with the Eritrea. So the Eritrean security forces can simply go and take anyone who they think are very, 
very, very important for them. And you know, the, the border between Eritrea and Sudan is like nobody's land, except the Eritreans, the Sudan's, they really don't have any security agents around there. So it was very risky. So I have to provide my case to the UN officials over there, and they accepted my case. Once my case was approved, it took me about a week to get my refugee card. At the same time, the, uh, I'm not sure that, yes, I got a scholarship, but how would this work out? Because I'm not in Eritrea, that was my uh, a reported residence address, this was my reported country to the scholarship providers, now I'm in a new country, will that work out? So it was very difficult. And being in that refugee camp, you start to stress out because you see people from Eritrea who doesn't have any plan at hand, have to make the other decision, a very difficult decision, which means they have to cross the Sahara Desert, just, it's, it's very uh, uh, unbelievable, I mean, in this age and century, it is very difficult, however they do it, they have to pay about $2,000 uh, $2, to $3,000. And then from there, from Libya, you have to cross to the, you have to cross the Mediterranean Sea and end up in Europe. And it's also another very risky war. I, I lost two of my cousins who tried to go that way. Uh, they, uh, they were on the boat, and the boat they uh, were on sank, and they lost their life. We lost a huge number of air trains that way, and it's really sad. One of my cousins, his father has... Uh, I mean, paid his life for the independence of Eritrea, and finally he ended up dying at sea also. After this, yeah, I went to Khartoum, which is the capital of Sudan. I uh, was uh, lucky enough to figure things out, and then I got my uh, uh, papers that are needed for my visa, and then at the same time, my wife was my girlfriend at that time, but the scholarship has gave me an opportunity to take my wife. She can join me while I'm in study. And to make that, I have to make sure to get married uh, uh, with her. So it is very difficult. You know, Sudan, they speak Arabic. I don't speak Arabic, either my, my wife. So, but we were very lucky. Uh, uh, we figured it out. We went to the uh, uh, courthouse and we get our uh, uh, marriage license. And then I left Sudan in, uh, in, 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 Ma in, in September 18 of 2006. And then my wife joined me seven months later in April of 2007. I finished my uh, master's degree in Belgium. And then we applied for a tourist visa to the United States, which it worked out very well. They give us one year multi-entry visa for, all of, for both of us. Then we came here in September of 2008, which was the best decision, best uh, thing that happened to us. However, it was a very bad time at that time. I, I think you all remember that. There was this economic meltdown happening. So it was very difficult for us to get a job. And uh, uh, it was very sad that nobody wants to hire a marine biologist. So uh, we already got our papers in, in a very fast way. It, it took out only a month to get our uh, asylum approved. So we got our work permit, we got our uh, social security, but then uh, finding a job was becoming a very tough decision. During that time, uh, we were living in San Jose. I had one of my former professors who also did the same thing, has to left the country. And we were sharing with him uh, uh, and his wife an apartment. Later, and I, I, uh, I got a job uh, through Manpower as just as an operator at Hitachi, uh, a microchip assembling. And then after working there for a year and a half, I got another uh, job as a startup in a startup company here in Mountain View. Uh, it's called Lens Vector and worked there for about two years. I have to make a, 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 a good decision that I shouldn't be a marine biologist no more. I have to study a new profession, and that profession ended up to be a clinical lab scientist. So I went to, to Texas Tech. I got my degree in 2015, worked in Reno for a year, and come back to the state of California. Now I work as a clinical lab scientist, as Elliot has mentioned it, for both Sutter Health and, and Kaiser Permanent in Oakland. And uh, yeah, for the rest of my family, still uh, my, both my parents are in Eritrea. I still have two of my siblings stuck in the Eritrean na National Service. And uh, two of my brothers are in Europe, another sister in Switzerland, I have a sister in, uh, in Texas, in Dallas, and one of my, oh, oh, well, the eldest uh, uh, sibling, or my, my eldest brother is still in Ghana. Well, yeah, so we are very lucky. We are uh, now uh, citizens of the United States, and we are very hopeful that the future will be bright for us and our, our kids. And again, thank you so much for paying your attention.
I want to say thank you for everyone for spending your evening here. This is part of a larger project called Made into America. And a few years ago at the Media Center, knowing that we do community media, but knowing that the core ingredient is people's stories, we started a platform for immigration stories. So if you have one, if anyone has one, you're invited to write it up and put it on there. And if you want, we'll come and interview you and write it up for you. And then you can check it. So check out madeintoamerica.org. Uh, it's where these stories are going to live as more and more people get to see the videos. And I just want to thank you all very much uh, for, for coming tonight. There's time to mingle. We're not going to start cleaning up for another 10 minutes or so. So uh, you can talk to the storytellers. And um, so thank you so much. Let's give them all a hand. <laughs> <laughs>